Hello, I'm Grant Smith. William Charles Turney was a postal worker for 31 years in the Port Huron, Michigan area. He delivered mail in all sorts of weather from blistering heat to chilling rain to freezing cold. He put up with many icy sidewalks, roaming dogs, and fast snowballs thrown by neighborhood kids. He didn't complain. It really didn't faze him because he had worse. He was a soldier in World War II. I went in the Army on September the 4th, 1944. And uh, went from there to Texas, Fort Hood, Texas, took my basic training. All right, man, and get your guns loaded. That was in late December. The, I was getting ready to go overseas, and I knew the Battle of the Bulge was going on, and I knew I was going to be in it. And uh, when I left home, I kind of said something stupid to my mom and dad, and I promised I'd be back. And stupid promise. So I went in, took basic training. We were supposed to have 16 weeks basic training. And as the war escalated in Europe with the Battle of Bulge, the Time got shorter and shorter, and instead of 16, it went down to 12. And I ended up uh, leaving there, let's see, five or six months. And then we, I went to the East Coast, and uh, I went overseas on the Queen Mary. They were using it as a troop ship. And then, then when they go across the ocean, they go south, north, south, north, trying to get away from the subs. And we had one sub that was spotted, but nothing happened. So I get to Scotland, took the train down to England, and then I crossed the channel on a Liberty ship, landed in well, Howard, France. Got on the train the next day, a 40 and 8, which used to be, they called it, 40 men, eight horses, uh, and it was just an old box car, and took that to Metz, France, and uh, we're going through all these towns. And as I went through France, there was a little town the train went through, and it was Barley Duc, France. And uh, there was an American hospital, American Army hospital, right there, and all the guys that were in the hospital were out there in their bathrobes and their combat boots. And, you'll be sorry, you'll be sorry. I didn't know what was going on. I wanted to get in a war because I had one brother younger than I, and I didn't want him to have to go. I knew I'm the guy that's going to go. So I couldn't wait to get there. And uh, so I got there and got assigned to a, went to a replacement depot and, and I got signed up with the 4th Armored Division, Company C, 53rd Armored Infantry Battalion. If the roads were good, you went on a half track or at the top of a tank. And if it was raining and the all muddy roads, you couldn't probably walk. So I'm most armored infant. Got up to the front, we went up on two and a half ton trucks, and uh, got off and we were marching up this road that was all torn to pieces. The trees, and all the tops of the trees were all gone and everything. And I looked on the ground and it was a boot. And like I say, I was just a snot nosed 18 year old kid, so I kicked the boot. And the boot flipped over and there was a foot in it. And I thought, hey, this is for real. Then I got serious. And so I got, went on up to the front and uh, one of the veterans said, don't get friendly with anybody because you're not going to be here that long. And it was true. And uh, 
I was one of the lucky ones. I'm here. And uh, so <coughs> Bastogne, they went to Bastogne, Belgium, down through Luxembourg, right next to Trier, Germany. I got shot on the 23rd of February. Sergeant told me once, to, well, the first time the sergeant told me, attorney, let's go. And I thought, oh boy, and I said, hey, I don't want to be the first scout. He said, come here. And I went over to him and he says, you've been with us for, well, it was like forever, but it was only a couple of weeks. He said, have you ever seen a scout get shot? And I said, no. And he says, do you know why? No. And he says, because they don't want to get the first one shoot the first ones, they want to let the first platoon, second platoon, third platoon go by, and then when they get the tail end, then they start from the back and go to the front. So you're not going to get killed first, but you are going to be on, on your own. So uh, that saved me. So I told him, I'll be a scout anytime, and thought I was really doing a good job. When I got shot, I was a scout, left flank. You're out front. In other words, you're, the, the guys are coming wherever they're coming from, along the edge of the woods, out across the field, out of some buildings, and I'm in front. And if I see anything, then I gotta holler down or whatever, or say left front, right front, wherever the shooting's coming from. It was, it was a big valley. Mountains on this side, mountains ahead of me, mountains. We had come down a mountain and we're in this flat field, a great big, huge field. 1,200 men, and they were coming in behind you, and they're all spread out. I was the scout, I could see everything, and I saw machine gun fire from here and here, and then the machine gun fire just crisscrossed that field like that. And uh, the first barrage got me. When I went down on the ground, I threw my hand up like this. That's where my hand was, right? I got shot in the head. I got shot right through here. The bullet stayed in my arm, so it saved me from getting shot in the head. God, if they would have hit me in the head, I be, wouldn't be here talking to you. They were throwing some light fire at us, like, you know, like rifle fire. And, uh, and then they started easing up and they didn't shoot us or nothing so I'm I'm green you know and I didn't know what was going on so I hollered up to sergeant I said uh, what's going on and he says uh, they're gonna they got us trapped we can't get out so they're gonna throw mortars in now they got a target we're in so pretty soon the mortars started coming in kill us all right there if they could the sergeant says do you know where those machine guns fired from? You were, you were the one, first one to see them, you know? And I said, yeah, I know where they were. I said, see all that green stuff down there? That's probably, that's probably little trees and bushes growing out of a creek. And I said, they're in the creek, big bad, and that's where they're firing from. He says, you're gonna have to go tell the company commander. I said, where's he? Well, he must be over by the road because we got no communication. We ain't got no walkie-talkies or nothing. And uh, just on your own. So I run out. I took my overshoes off because I, I, I didn't have any combat boots. I had buckle glasses. I took the glasses off and left my rifle, my all my ammo and all my good gas mask, everything. So I run across this open field. The only thing in this open field was a few bales of, of hay. How many they, but they don't bale it. They, it was a little, they just rake it up in a pile. Well, that ain't gonna stop now. A little pile of straw. I was pretty scared, but I could always run. When I was in school, there was only one guy that could run faster than I could. So I, I could run. And boy, I took them galoshes off, and I, when I took off, I ran. Come to that first pile, I thought, well, I'll get behind here. And then I looked up, and it's all loose straw. That ain't going to stop no bullet, <laughs> you know. And when I got to the edge of the road, there was a medic waiting for me. And I just dove right in the ditch, you know. And he come right over to help me, and I said, 
Where's the company commander? I got a message. I got a message. I got to get it out. And uh, so he says, well, you, can't, you can't run down that road. There's a little back top road, ditch on each side. And then it was like the, the ground was like that. So I, of course, by this time, where I got shot was starting to get to me. So I got up and I'm running down the road and everybody's hollering at me, get down, get down. And all I could hear was small arms fire. And when I got down to them, I, here's all the, my company commanders and all the brass was down there. And uh, uh, I said, I, a message from Sergeant Haney. And I said, uh, the, I, I know where those machine guns are. So about that time, I thought the world came to an end because I was standing up talking to these guys and one of them reached out, grabbed me by the ankles and pulled me down. I went down like a telephone pole, you know, and I kind of shook me up a little bit and he said, you're going to get killed. Get down here. When I was running with that message, I had an M43 jacket on and when I got to the road, they were firing a, a 20 millimeter and they, 20 millimeter, if it touches anything, it explodes just a little shrapnel. And the back of my jacket and the back of my neck all had little pieces of red hot uh, shrapnel, you know, just peppered me. Did nothing to kill me, but just peppered me. And those guys, and they start beating me on the back, and I thought they were saying, good job, you know. And here they're trying to put fire out. It was just smoldering, but it was, and I uh, told them in that, I said, see that, all that bush stuff over there? There's gotta be a creek running through here. And they're down the banks of the creek, and that's where they crisscrossed the fire at us. They said, okay, so they radioed up to the, the hill, to the mountains, it was all small mountains, and did that. Well, that's when the mortars started to come in, and and they were trying to zero in on the mortars. So uh, I had passed up and they uh, took me back to the rear. I went to the hospital. Uh, they took me to a church or a, or a school auditorium, I'm not sure. And I can remember laying on the table with my arm out like this and, and uh, there was a nurse at my shoulders rubbing my back or my neck and that and keep me calm. They didn't have enough to put me out. And I laid there with my arm like out on a little board. Lay on, I was laying on a table and I could see the doctor working. I saw him take the scalpel and, and cut and, you know, the little ripples of skin go up like bup, bup, bup. And the third time he cut, to get it out, I passed out and I came right back. The nurse was telling me, you're all right, you're all right. And, well, when I went to the hospital, then there was fighting when, when I left. And then some of the guys that got hurt in that fighting was with me when my incident happened. And, and so they told me, and they called in more reinforcements and went up to there where they could look down this creek bed and then they fired down the creek bed and, and then they were, Germans were scattering. I said, did everybody get out? And they said, yeah, we lost a few and, and they had a few wounded in that hospital with me in Barley Duke. So now I'm one of the guys out front waving at the guys going up saying, you'll be sorry. So uh, I, I think I was in the hospital 17 days, I think. And the doctor I had, he had a Polish name about that long. And we always called him, he said, just call me Dr. Casey. So he was just a great guy. And he come in one day and he says, Bill, he says, I got to talk to you. He says, things are getting tough up at the front. He says, the battle of the ball just said, says we're losing a lot of people and I can't keep you here too much longer. Yeah, I know you're just a kid. And he says, this is the worst job that I've ever had. This is to say, you gotta go back up front. And then I 
realized that this is serious business. But the guy that told me, the sergeant that told me, don't make any friends up here. You got to have a foxhole, buddy. Somebody that will protect you, you protect him. But other than that, don't talk about his family, don't talk about your family to him, because nine chances out of ten, you're going to be dead real quick. And it uh, makes you think a little bit. Uh, but uh, good Lord will, I, I'm here. Welcome back to the second part of Sworn to Return. We have just heard how Bill Turney, who was in the field for only a couple of weeks, was wounded and still able to deliver a message to his commanding officers, all while being shot at by enemy soldiers. Upon hearing his story, we declared, you're a hero. You just saved 1,200 men. Bill looked at us and humbly said, it wasn't me who saved them. It was the battalion. All I did was deliver a message. Bill said he was just doing his job. Now let's join him as he goes back to the front. When I got out of the hospital, I went to a replacement depot. I got sent back up to the front. I ran into a friend that was a cook in my outfit. He was from Chicago and he got, he got sick. He didn't get wounded, but he got sick and went back to the hospital. And uh, we met on this train to go back up the front. And I, so we sat down and talked together and I said, you know what? We could be going to any outfit in Europe. We don't know what we're going to get into. So the, all of the trucks and whatever transportation from everybody that was going back up the front. So we started walking through, looking for one that said 4th Armored Division. So we're going up together, so finally we come to a truck. We asked the driver, each truck driver we'd ask, or that's their assistant, where are you heading? Where are you taking this stuff? And we got to one, he says, we're heading for the 4th Armored. Can we hit to ride? He says, I'm not going to say yes, and I'm not going to say no. He says, but when we leave, if you're in the back of the truck, you're going to the 4th Armored. So we got back to our own outfit. And the guys that we knew and could depend on. And so we got back up to the outfit and uh, started the same thing again. Scouts out and it went on from there. And uh, it was nasty. The Germans knew that they were on their last leg. And they brought every piece of equipment they could get to come up to stop this battle of bolt because they were the one that was making the attack we're holding and by this time the Germans had brought all in their SS troops well to be an SS troop you had to be six foot two or three and they were monsters I'm telling you they were gung-ho they were fighters I mean they were tough and I knew that at five foot six I couldn't whip them so I had to shoot them. And they were diehards. You couldn't give them a break. You had to kill them. And the one thought was, kill as many as you can. Maybe your brother won't ever have to come. And so that's what I tried to do, because even though I promised my mom and dad I'd be back, which was foolish, uh, I never expected to get back. You have two purposes. One is to kill, and the other is to avoid being killed. To that end, you use every method and every weapon you can. So during the war, that M1 weighed nine and a half pounds. And the ammunition was the clips and everything, and I carried two bandoliers and a cartridge belt with all the ammo in it so I could hardly walk. And the worst part of that M1, it was a wonderful weapon, except you put the clips in. You got like eight rounds in a clip, a metal clip, and you just pull the bolt back and pop that down with your thumb, 
and you got eight more shots and you could load it real quick. The only thing was, especially on a patrol, when you fire those eight clips or eight shots, when the last one goes out, the clip goes out and it goes ka -ching! like a cash register. So they hear ka -ching! and they know I'm out of ammo. So you got to be able to load quick and have somebody beside you say, I'm going to I'm going to lose a clip here in a minute. So he says, all right, I'll wait. And then when I would go ka-ching, then he'd try to protect me. And I'd try to protect him. But that's the only thing I had wrong. The Grand was a wonderful weapon. And I never did qualify with the Grand M1 rifle. I was a P-poor shot. I went through the firing line three times. And the officer come up and said, firing. My officer, he said, what's he doing? He, said, he couldn't hit the broad side of a barn. One day, I come into the camp back on my job I was doing. I think it was Sergeant Haney. He says, hey, here. And he went like this, and I saw this object coming at me. And uh, it was a Thompson submachine gun with the stock, wooden stock broke off. All I had was the metal parts. It wasn't, and it held clips. Not a drum. It held clips. He says, try this. And then he threw a set bag at me. And it had a couple of empty clips in it. He says, go get your 45 ammunition. Load those up. And he says, next time we go out, he says, you practice. Kill as many as you can. And that thing just, you, you held the clip with one hand up here. And then I had the trigger guard and all that back here. And I learned to take that sucker and start from the ground up. And when the sergeant gave it to me, he said, maybe you can hit something with this. And he says, just one thing I got to tell you. You're probably not going to like it. The one that's firing the most bullets is a target. He says, so when you use that Thompson, you're a target, son. He says, don't you ever forget it. He said, you can shoot a lot of bullets, but you're a target. And I found out pretty quick that that was true. So I did well with it. It was easy to carry, and I had musette bags crisscrossed on my chest, and I must have carried 15, or, at least 15 or 16 full clips. Each clip had 45 rounds in it, I think. And I could change that thing so quick. And I got through the rest of the war with that. So I got to tell you this. So we got a new second lieutenant to come up. You know, a 90 day wonder. We had a lot of them. And they're going to come up and they're going to win the war overnight. And I shouldn't say that because we did have a few that were came in and really, really far. We had one first lieutenant that was, he was, He'd take on anybody or anything. He, he was always in the front. You didn't have to wait for an officer to tell you what to do because he's at the front leading it. And I would be next to him. And uh, this one, he, he came up and I was out on a, doing an inspection, seeing where we were for the night. When I come back to go to the half track, I'd sleep in the half track. The second lieutenant's got his officers are asleep in the bag and all this crap in the back of the half track. And here's a whole bunch of guys waiting around just to see what's going to happen because they knew me pretty good. I got up in that half track and they threw all his crap out on the ground and it was cold and muddy and wet. And I threw all out on him. He says, what's going on here, soldier? I said, that's where I sleep. You earn that spot. You can put your sack any place you want it, except here. And I said, it's going to be you and me right here if you try to pull mine out. And I guess he, the guys knew that I was up tight. And I don't know if they gave him a look or not, but he didn't bother me. So I proceeded to pick my stuff up, and that's where I'd sleep if it was a half track there. Well, that was dumb, because an armored piece of material, whether it's a tank or a half track, is a target. So I was just a target. But 
Fortunately, I never got, the half track never got blew up during the night like that. I never had any more trouble with that second lieutenant. I mean, he probably heard some stories about some of the nasty things I'd done. And, and uh, I wasn't very big, but I was going to take care of myself and my buddies. Uh, during the Battle of the Bulge, the temperature was from 15 to 20 below, almost 18 inches, maybe 19 inches of snow. We're in the Hurtgen Forest, and artillery had been shooting back and forth, the Germans and us, and there's all these trees, these great big boughs were off these pine trees, all pine trees. So when I'm up on line, I'm walking up in 18 inches of snow. I report, I said, uh, you know, William Turney, I'm reporting for duty. Okay, he says, find a place to bat him. That's it. On the Battle of Bulge, we fought in summer uniforms. It was awful. You wake up in the morning and first thing you do is try to grab your feet and rub them, get them warm because it was cold. And of course, after I was there, they gave me a few uh, tips on what to do, you know. I, they were a good bunch. I was with a good outfit. We couldn't have anything hot. We couldn't make coffee. We couldn't heat food. We couldn't do nothing. The only thing we had at the time was these little sterno cans. And we'd try to warm some K rations were in cans. Then the, uh, they had the rations in the box. No, they were K rations in the box. And you got dry crackers and and some lemonade powder and some coffee powder. And then we couldn't have any hot water. And uh, it was cold, we were cold all the time. So you, you take your boots and you just make a spot to lay down in the, all that snow. Then you get some of these pine bows and you throw them in the trench or in the space where you did it. And then you get a couple more over next to you and you just lay down on those pine bows and pull the other ones you got ready, pull them over you. We couldn't use the sleeping bags or they were so small. A army blanket, a light army blanket sewed into a sack that even a little guy like me, I was five foot six and I was about 165 pounds at that time. And uh, uh, I could hardly get into it. Just, just like a blanket sewed up. The officers had nice plusher ones, but we didn't. Cold, it was just so cold, you, you can't believe it. And I carried mail for 31 years, but I was never as cold as I was in the Battle of the Bulge. Guys, not moving in the morning, you go over and they're froze to death. <laughs> that, I'm serious, that they're froze to death overnight. You go to bed at night and say, please let me wake up in the morning. You, it's the first guy you see that you know, you say, well, is today our day? You look forward to getting killed every day you got up. I tried to be a good soldier. And I think I was. War is hell. And I was in the middle of it. I'm proud that I was there. I did everything I could. I killed every German I could see that I could shoot. But I figured I should, everyone, they killed one of ours, I'll kill 10 of theirs. I knew I had to do what I had to do, and I tried to do it. And I'll never forget the first German they shot, ever. He's right there, I can see him. Well, look on his face. Then I go through his papers and see his family pictures and I kind of said to myself, I can't do this. And I thought of my brother again. I don't want him to have to go through this, so I guess I'm the one that's gonna go through it. And you look on the ground, you see the dead GIs. My buddies are laying there dead. This guy's got a gun in his hand, he's shooting at me. What do I do? I gotta kill him. I got no choice. One of those is gonna hit me if I don't kill him. 
And that's, I'm ashamed of that. But the old saying, war is war. And you're either going to win it or you're going to lose it. So you better fight as hard as you can to win it. No one on Bill's postal route knew the stories and the guilt that Bill carried with him each day along with the sack of letters. They just saw a dedicated mailman with a friendly smile. But ironically, Bill didn't set out to become a postal worker. He really wanted to be a police officer. But the World War II veteran with the Silver Star, Bronze Star, and 23 other medals, the man who ran through gunfire and fought enemy soldiers face to face, could not become a police officer, was not allowed to become a cop. He could become a foot soldier on the front lines, but he could not be on the police force due to height regulations. He was deemed too short. Now let's watch part three of Sworn to Return. In the American sector, United States tanks take their place in the Allied strategy to drive Rommel into the sea. The commander, Lieutenant General Patton, surveys the Axis positions. Patton was a great man. If we'd had a couple more generals like him, the war would have been shortened much. Saw him on one rainy morning. <coughs> we were staying in a farmhouse. It was raining nasty, wet, damp, dirty day. And we start seeing this column coming down the road. And lo and behold, it was Patton in the headquarters company. And he came in in his Jeep. And he had his two pearl handle guns on. He put his leg out of that Jeep and he had his jodfers on, his boots and his riding breeches. And he looked like a million bucks. And when he stood up, he didn't bend. He stood up. And uh, Pat was a good man. He had, but he had some crazy ideas, too. He was not as crazy as Hitler, but he had some crazy ideas. And I firmly believe that had I not been in the Third Army with Patton, that I wouldn't be here. I think he loved all of us soldiers, but he knew how to win a war and how to go into an attack. He was a tactician, very good. Like we always used to say, our blood, his guts. He went to war to win, and that's what I felt that I did. So when we'd have to do something as practically impossible, that he set up. At least my outfit, my battalion, stood behind him and gave their all. Most of the guys in the war gave their all. It, was, it wasn't just my outfit or me or anything. I was just a pebble on the beach and I really gave everything I had. I definitely wanted to get home. I wanted to keep that promise to my mother and I just knew at the time that I wasn't gonna be able to do that because I had no control over it. When we went into battle, all I could think of was, I'm a scout. I'm first out, first in line. I'm gonna be dead first. I wasn't much for prayer at first. I mean, I went to Sunday school every day of my, every Sunday of my life. During the war, I did a lot of praying with everybody else. We'd pray together. And I'd go into every church I passed when we were taking a town. If it was a church, I'd have to go in it. But at the end of the war, we knocked everything down. I mean, Munich was a fantastic, beautiful city. It was wonderful. When I came through Munich, there was nothing. Nothing. It was awful. And when they church one day, we would just, I had a couple seconds, and I went in, and there was an old German lady in there praying. 
and for probably one of the first times in my life, I didn't know what to do. I wanted to tell her I'm sorry because her church was a shambles. And it's not my fault. Blame Hitler. <laughs> he started this. But I didn't say anything. I just nodded my head and took my helmet off and went on my way because I was there and there for a second, but I felt so sorry for the civilians. To the south, the 4th Armored Division, spearheading General Patton's Rhine push, passes liberated forced laborers. The disorder of the German retreat is made evident by groups of Nazis giving themselves up without offering resistance. This dash by the 4th Armored precedes the final battle for the Tsar Moselle Rhine Triangle and 3rd Army crossings of the Rhine. The town of Weissenturm, Germany, is littered with equipment of every description, abandoned by the Nazis as they were backed up to the river. The 4th Armored alone captures more than 4,000 prisoners in its drive through the West German hills. The next episode, we come in to a little town called Ordruf. And you could smell the dead bodies before you got there. And we knew we were coming to a prison camp. And that's with the dead boys you could smell. And if you never smelled a dead body, I hope you never smell one. The gag mag. The guys are all hanging on the wire like this. I can see their clawed hands. Their ribs all sticking out. Their legs are about as big around as that. And they got on whatever kind of material that they're supposed to have black and white striped stuff. Some did, some didn't. Skin and bones, skeletons. Anything they were wearing was hanging on like you threw a paper towel over you. <coughs> That's the part that got me part of it. And that was, that was bad, bad, bad. And all the time you're doing it, you're trying to keep from throwing up. They went with a bulldozer, and they'd go with the bulldozer and dig it out about five, six feet deep, and then throw the bodies in like cordwood, pile them on top of another. And all, all they were was skin and bones. And so we got out of that one and we're trying to figure out where's the guards well and somebody come and told us that the guards were running up the hill from the prison camp they tried to fight back but we run them off and killed every one of them as they were trying to go up this hill and general eisenhower a man hardened by the blood and shock of war seems appalled at these unbelievable sights Accompanied by General Bradley on his revolting mission, and also by General Patton, hard-boiled yet visibly moved, the Supreme Commander sees demonstrations of the torture racks. How many were put to the torch, no one will know. How many while alive? Lime pits, flesh-eating, bone-consuming lime, accounted for others. Germans are conducted to a murder shed where thousands too ill to be herded to the rear by Nazis were slain in cold blood. So we went on, the ne that was the 4th of April. Then a week later, on the 11th of April, we came to uh, the big camp. Most dreadful of all the camps was at Buchenwald where only 20,000 of the original 80,000 were found alive. Slave laborers worked on the V-2 bomb, serial numbers tattooed on their stomachs. Six furnaces, each holding three bodies, were used in cremating the dead and often the living. Some lay dying among the bodies of the dead. Ridden with all the worst diseases known to mankind and without medical attention or food enough to keep them alive, the prisoners died daily by the hundreds after rescue, despite any aid we could give them. Here is documentary evidence of sheer mass murder. 
Murder that will blacken the name of Germany for the rest of recorded history. These great big buildings, these gas chambers, and they just run all the people in there like, and then shut the doors all and windows all down and turn the gas on. And then they'd haul them out of there with tractors, bulldozers, and drop all the bodies and then take them and put them in a new ditch. And the stench, honest to God, the stench is awful. You probably smelled a dead cat in the road or a dead rat. That's nothing. A dead human body is the most foul smell that I ever smelled in my life. And you know what? I can smell it right now. And, but you gotta keep going. Now we're chasing the guards from this camp. They're running away from the camp. We're chasing them up the road. I mean, some of our vehicles were chasing them. I was on foot at that time. And uh, the atrocities that were committed during World War II and what they did to the, our prisoners, what they did to their own people. That Hitler was a, I don't have a word to describe him. And if we wouldn't have stopped him, guess where we'd be today? I fought as hard as I could. Killed as many Germans as I could. When I started killing them, I was counting them in my head and I had to quit. I just had to quit. All I could think of was when I'm killing these people, these soldiers, they're doing it. They're ordered to do it. They're, well, I was ordered to do it, fight each other. And I just figured everyone I killed was one that ain't gonna kill me. And one that ain't gonna get a chance to kill my brother. Uh, and that's the way it went. The last days of the war, the last couple, we were up in, uh, up by Chemnitz and up higher in the northern part. And we thought we had the, the town pretty well cleared. And I was sitting in the back of the half track with my gun. And we heard this commotion. And there was guys sitting on this side of the half track and I was sitting on this side. They were looking this way and I'm looking that way. So we could cover each other's back. And we heard a, a little bit of a noise, you know. And we heard a lady's voice, an elderly lady's voice, like a grandma saying, nine, 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 which means no. And the door broke open and here comes a kid, I don't think he was 12, 13 years old. And he came out with a shotgun. And we're sitting there like ducks in a gallery. We had no choice. We had to kill him. 12 year old kid. And I don't, those are the kind of things that I have trouble getting over. It was awful. And I thought to myself many times, if I would, am I going to be seen when I get out of this war? Welcome back. Even after the war, Bill faced many challenges. He worked two, sometimes three different jobs besides his postal position in order to support his family. And Bill did all of this, even though he suffered from a painful back injury a back injury that occurred a year after the war ended on a motorcycle accident in his hometown of Portier, Michigan. He spent a long time recuperating from that accident, learning to walk again, learning to work again, and learning, obviously, to live again. The front page of the Times-Herald newspaper summed up the severity of the accident in one sentence. Turney is not expected to live through the night. 
Now let's watch the conclusion of Sworn to Return, where the war is ended, and how William Turney goes from killing the enemy to wanting to protect the enemy. The war was going to end in the next couple, three days. And I thought, what's going to happen now? An officer comes over and he says, you, 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 and you. Pick four of us out. He told me I was in charge. But see, I didn't have a big rank. I was only a technician, fifth grade. Didn't want any stripes on my shoulders because they're the ones that had to give the orders to the younger ones, go get killed. And I couldn't do that. I could do it for myself, which I did. But I couldn't look at these younger kids that come in. They were 18, but I wasn't even a buck sergeant. But I was expert in driving a half track. I couldn't drive a tank, but I drove a half track. And with the guns that I was using, I was familiar with them. So went over and 5,000 German prisoners from the guys we were fighting, 5,000 of them wanted to give up. They didn't want to be killed. But as the war retreated back, 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 their families came from all over Germany to be with them. So we got mothers and fathers and grandmas and grandpas and grandkids and babies. And 5,000 of these people are going to give up to us. And I'm supposed to, one of those four of us. So we go up to where we were supposed to pick them up. On the map, it was Hill 264. I had the map. We went out in a half track. It was me and, and uh, two other guys in the half track. We had a machine gun on the turret and one on the side, and then one at the rear corner. And that's what we had. It could take 5,000 people. Now, we knew these, some of these German soldiers had guns. We knew that. So, we, we were on the lookout. We were up high on this Hill 263 or 64, I can't remember. And we, it, you ever see a column of ants coming down like this? That was people. They're coming out from the trees and the high, and they're coming down like a train. Mothers, fathers, everybody. And they come down. I thought, this ain't going to work. I'm not going to live the end of the war. And I was thinking to myself at the time. So I went out, got to the front of the column that was coming down and stopped them. And one of the guys that was with me, they sent one of the guys that was with us, could speak a little German. And all these people wanted to do was give up. So we had to drive a boat three miles, I guess, from where we picked them up on this mountain or hill until we got to an open space and there was a great, it was a farm area and there was a great big huge pond. You know, there's, some of them had, it was a huge pond. And we put them up there and then they let all the people go in that area. We had tanks all around to guard them. And they hadn't been cleaned up or anything, the people. And the next thing you know, there's kids and grandmas and grandpas all swimming in this water, in this pond, taking baths, and the ladies are washing the babies, and, and we thought, well, that's, not, that's good, that's, that's good. So we didn't know what was going on. I was waiting for orders, and I get the orders. We're supposed to turn all of these people, with the kids and everything, over to the Russians. And we knew the Russians would kill them. Now what do we do? Are we going to fight the Russians right here and keep these people safe or what? Just then, 
lieutenant comes down and he says, just let the Russians take him. And I said, that's not right. This is not the way it is. We're the good guys. <laughs> let them take him. So we were sitting and there's a, a stream, a, a little creek that come out of that pond and coming. It was behind where we were. And uh, they were using it for a toilet and everything else. So there's all kinds of waste floating in this. All of a sudden we heard the ruckus. We were out there all, we had our arms and everything. We just didn't know what was going to go on yet. Other than we had to give them to the Russians. And we heard pop, pop, pop. And we knew it was a gun because we're all taking cover. And here a German guy, a German soldier, had had a small caliber 25 caliber pistol. And it was him and his wife and his daughter. The daughter was probably eight or nine years old, prettiest thing you ever saw. And he shot his wife in the head. He shot the little girl in the head. And he tried to shoot himself in the head. And when he shot himself in the head, he didn't kill himself. So we immediately took over the situation. And here's this mother, and father, and the little girl like she's laying in a sewer. It was something else. And we had orders not to touch them, not to touch the Russians. And they were trying to rape every woman that was there. They were animals. I mean animals. So we stopped that. We were able to stop that. They, the officers all got together and said this raping them beating up the women when they had to stop. And well, this time all I want to do is get the hell out of there because I'm in charge of the GIs I brought in. And I wasn't even an officer, nothing. I was just Bill. And that upset me pretty good, like everything else. And I think to myself, how much more of this can you take? You know, I'm running out of gas. So anyway, we got things straightened around and then trucks came in and took out all those people that gave up to the Americans. They gave up to the Americans to be safe. They wanted to give up to the English or the Americans. They didn't want to give up to the Russians. And when he got through that, I talking to some of the guys and I said, I sure, I sure hope the war is over now, because so they've had it. To every Londoner that has ever taken one of my soldiers into his home, I say you'll always have my profound gratitude. You have done something in cementing bonds that must always remain between your country and mine, and into which scope must be brought Russia, France, China, all the other great countries that have helped to whip this Nazi, and we hope will quickly whip Japan. The after the war farewell of the two leaders who worked together so closely in achieving the victory in Europe. That was the end of it. I wrote a letter to my mother and I said, Mom, I'm going to stay over here. I got the world by the seat of the pants because the guys that were over there experienced got all the good jobs. And, and it was wonderful. So I had it made over there. I signed up for six months. So I get a letter from my aunt who lived next door. If you don't get home, you're not going to see your mother alive. 
So I go down to the orderly room and I try to get them to cut my orders for reenlistment, which they did. And I came home. And mom was fine. My aunt just... I would have stayed in the army all my life. I got home June the 6th. Sitting by myself on the bus looking at all the places I'd been and places with things I've done. And uh, we got up to Port Yarn and went up Pine Grove Avenue and I worked at that gas station at Thomas Street Crossing. Got off the bus and there's my old boss in his gas station. And there's a few tears there. I went in the gas station and Uncle George come in, and I don't know if he had seen me or what. And he always loved me. And we hugged and cried. And he says, your mother's just around the corner. She's going to the store. I'll get her. Nellie, Nellie, come here, come here. She's waving and he doesn't see Billy, so he just said, come here. I was inside the gas station. And she came in that gas station. I'm sorry. And she seen me. Bill's home. He's alive. You know. And I got home and my my dad was there and we had a good time just went through my head that you did keep your promise but it wasn't you that did it it was just the way things fell into place it was great it was so good to be home and see my mom my brother my dad my grandma and all the neighbors came down because I was I lost a few friends in the neighborhood. I had a friend named LaVon Huss. He had come from Montana to Port Huron. And he got killed in the war. And, and uh, he was in the infantry. And the kid down the block, his name was Teddy O'Rourke. And he was an Air Force pilot. He flew a bomber. His bomber turned up, didn't return to base, and he was gone. I had another buddy, his name was, last name was Alloway, and he lived up just up Stone Street, a couple blocks from the cemetery. And he was in the Navy early in the war, and his sub disappeared, and they never knew what happened to him. And then I met my wonderful wife. I wanted to get married so bad. I've always wanted a kid, you know, have children. And, and I, I didn't know if I should get married or not. And I went to the minister after I found Barb and I said, do you think I can be a good husband? Do you think this war is gonna keep on me and so on? And so they said, and <clears throat> they couldn't tell. Said some guys carry it with them and some guys have to fall off the train. So, so I got a good woman. She was been with me every day for 70s, putting her 71 years. It was just, just my barb. My wife brought me through. I have to give her credit for it all. My wife is a great woman. I had a great family. So proud of the career my daughter had. That I can walk on water. And uh, and I have a second daughter that's got MS and lupus. Her life was been bad. 
and we had a son, Michael, and he's such a good kid, great kid, and I love him. To, I love all my kids to death. So I probably wouldn't be here today had I not had a good family and a good wife. It's not the end of my love story yet, but. <laughs>